Welcome to Wycliffe as we begin the quest. We will explore how getting away from home or just a step away from the usual routine can expand our horizons and our faith and help us see our life in new ways. The idea of a quest or pilgrimage has long been a common spiritual practice. Early Christians journeyed to Jerusalem to the site where Jesus was crucified and resurrected. And as the faith expanded around the world, substitute pilgrimages became popular as well as the realization that the journey itself can provide as much spiritual growth as the destination. We welcome Reverend Nancy Rowland to the pulpit today as we consider taking those first steps in a journey. Friends, it's good for us to worship here together again this week. Let us pray. God of mercy, you are full of tenderness and compassion, slow to anger, rich in mercy, and always ready to forgive. Grant us grace to renounce all evil and cling to Christ, that in every way we may prove to be your loving children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I lift up my eyes to the hills, From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day. Nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from from this this time time on and and forevermore. Our gospel lesson today is Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. A teaching of Jesus as he proceeds on the way of his ministry. Listen for the word of God. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those that are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. For this gift of holy word, thanks be to God. One of my Facebook friends is a wonderful woman, also a retired minister like I am, um, who lost her husband some years ago to death, her beloved husband, and I know she misses him terribly much. 
But I see on her Facebook page the most amazing story. She moved to Tennessee to be closer to family, but then she bought a recreational vehicle, a camper. And with that camper, she is steadily on the road all the time, going to this state park and that, parking by the river or across the open lake or high in the mountains, surrounded by trees. And everywhere she goes, she's making new friends. She's gathering people around a campfire. And she seems to be having the most wonderful time. I so admire my friend Donna for her ability to move on and to make a new life on the road, on the road with Jesus, as it were, always waiting for the next adventure that she will be offered. So many years ago, I remember calling another church to speak with someone there, and after a long uh, wait on the rings, the, the answering machine came on, and one of the, the staff people said, we're not here right now, but we are out having adventures in the kingdom of God. And I just openly laughed. I thought that is the greatest way of saying what we should be doing with our lives, getting out on the road and having adventures in the kingdom of God. One of my favorite children's books is The Runaway Bunny by Margaret Wise Brown. It's sort of her companion volume to, do, to Goodnight Moon. And The Runaway Bunny in this book goes from place to place, and always, even though he says, I am running away, his mother is always there finding him. He becomes a fish. She becomes a fisherman. He becomes a rock. She becomes a rock climber. He becomes a bird. She becomes a tree. He becomes a sailboat. She becomes the wind. Finally, he says, oh, shucks, I might as well just come home and be a little boy. And you can be my mama. And so it was. Now, I've always thought this book was a wonderful illustration of Psalm 139. Where shall I go from your spirit? Even there you shall find me. You will hold me fast. But I like to think of this as also now, as in today's readings, a commentary on Psalm 27 about how God is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? The stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? That the little bunnies going off on the kind of thing little bunnies ought to be doing. That's having adventures in life, in the kingdom of God. And yet, even as he goes, his mother's love is there with him every moment of the way. It never leaves him until that final day that he comes home to her arms in final rest. It's a wonderful image to know that we can go far afield in life, that we can be on the road moment by moment by moment, and God will always be there, like a turtle with its shell on its back, or like my friend in her camper, 
that there is a life on the road that's to be had. And with God's care with us along the way, we will find it. These are helpful words for someone who, like me, is kind of a homebody. I like my house. I like the kind of house that's attached to a foundation. And I know it's going to be there when I come home. Sometimes my little grandson talks about uh, hurricanes are scary and how they will blow away homes that don't have foundations, and I reassure him that my house has a wonderful foundation, and so does his. And In fact, both of their houses are attached to other houses, so they're not going to go anywhere, and that is a comfort to have that foundation, but not if we're afraid to go outside the house to try new experiences that maybe a little out of our comfort zone. I suspect that my friend Donna has a much bigger comfort zone than I do. But still, we are each called to travel outside that comfort zone, to, to, like Jesus, confront the demons of our day and cast them out, to approach people with dread diseases and heal them, to do scary things for scary times. United Church of Christ has a slogan that means a lot to me. It says, never put a period where God has put a comma. I think I've been putting a lot of periods in my life when God still has lots more adventures to come up with. And that was what Luke's Jesus paints a picture of. A people who are looking for love in all the wrong places. In places that seem stable and secure, but turn out not to be. And so we are asked by Jesus rather confrontational conversation with these Pharisees who perhaps they were looking out for his best interests, perhaps not, but were warning him off his work because it might offend Herod who is looking for him. Jesus is not scared. He knows the one to whom he belongs. Now, go tell that fox for me. I've got work to do here, and I'm going to keep on my way today. I'm going to keep on my way tomorrow. I'm going to keep on my way the third day. I must be on my way because that is where you will find me and that is where you will find God. And then he says these poignant words, these sad words are not unlike the ones he says when he sees Jerusalem when it's time to go to his death. Here he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, You are the ones that have killed the prophets, stoned those who were sent to them. And all I've been trying to do is gather you under my wings like a loving mother hen gathers her brood. Why would you not have that? Can we do what Jerusalem did not? For them, their house of desolation was left to them. In just a few years, the temple would be torn down and Jerusalem would be destroyed. And yet, still they're clinging to this hope 
in brick and mortar. It's kind of like the old slogan, well, it may be hell, but at least we know the street signs. Can we dare to move out of what we know that has actually served so toxic for us and go on our way and be glad of the care that God gives us on the road. There is this new modern parable that's been spoken many times of the man who lived in a two-story house on the edge of a river. And the storm came and the river rose. And he looked out the windows and the river was getting higher and it was also almost approaching the house and almost approaching the road. And finally, a jeep comes along and says, come on, sir, we're evacuating this area. It's all going to be flooded soon. And the man in his self-righteous mode says, oh, no, not me. I have faith in God. God will save me. And the jeep goes down the road. And a little while later, the man looks out of the window and finds that the water is coming up on the outside of the house. And he runs upstairs and sees outside his window upstairs that there's a boat coming by. And the man in the boat says, come on, sir, this may be your last chance for evacuation. Get in the boat. And the owner of the house says, no, I'm going to stay with my house. I believe in God, and God will see me through. And the man said, well, it's your life. Bye. And he motors off away. And finally, the water is getting so high that it's filling up the second floor, and the man climbs the stairs up to the roof, stands on the roof, and up above him is a helicopter. And the helicopter sending down a ladder, and the emergency crew is saying, get on the ladder, climb up, you need to be saved. And the man says, oh, no, I am depending upon God. God will save me because my faith is in God. And so it is that the man drowned. And he went to the pearly gates. And he said, what happened here? I had faith in you, God. You let me die. You did not save me. And God says, I sent you a jeep. I sent you a boat. I sent you a helicopter. What more would you have me do for you? What do we want God to do for us? What do we have that faith in? Is it God? Or is it our house that we can't let go of, even though we can't climb the stairs anymore? Is it our temple? Our beautiful church, even when people don't come to it anymore, is it our whole structure of beliefs, what we've all, always been told to be true? Is that what I have my faith in? What do you have a hard time giving up? Might it be your job? when you retire or when you're let go? Might it be your house where there's so many memories or your children 
when they grow up and go their own way? Perhaps it would be your worn out attitudes, those subtle prejudices that you learned oh too well and don't want to give up. Maybe it's your belongings that you're hoarding away, those mementos of a previous life. Whatever it is that you have a hard time giving up, let it go. Allow yourself to be encircled by the loving arms, the caring embrace of your God. I previously served a congregation that was founded in 1657 as a, a Dutch Reformed congregation and by the end of that century had become Presbyterian and in 1707 they built their meeting house and they built it to last. It's a marvelous building. Fifty years later, they decided it wasn't as grand as it ought to be because the Episcopalians across the street had a very tall steeple. And so they built a brownstone Gothic monstrosity. Didn't match the nice brick colonial church at all. And they went and worshipped in that because it had a wonderful high tower. But after a hundred years, it became structurally deficient. Now, that might have been the moment where they needed to pour lots of money into a building that would take an inordinate amount of repair. But instead, in the early 1950s, they decided to tear the whole place down. And they went back into the meeting house that had been turned into Sunday school rooms and they restored that to its 18th century appearance. And that is where they then resumed their worship. Sometimes That change that God is asking of us requires us to give up what we're holding on to. Anne Lamott puts it this way. She says, I pray that God will take over my life and sh show me a new way. And then one day I look out the window and there's a wrecking ball destroying everything that I have been. And those are the hard words of Jesus. To give up what no longer is working and to lay hold of a God that will see us through. Says Paul to the Philippians, for many live as enemies of, the, of Christ and their end is destruction their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. Or in Genesis, where Abraham's faith is reckoned to him as righteousness. But to do that, he had to get on the road. He had to leave everything he'd ever known. He had to take a leap of faith again and again and again to do what for him was fairly impossible. But my friends, for God there is nothing that is impossible, only possible things that happen to lead through confusion and chaos and suffering. This is the road of Lent where we walk again with Jesus, where we face up to the things in our lives that just haven't 
worked and we let go to God and we take a breath and we become ready to live life on the road under the care of the Almighty. May it be so. There is a prayer Like a wide river It never ends Does not begin Around the world It's always flowing And I am stepping in We are stepping in We are praying With those in distant places Different languages and faces Every hour of the day And we are praying With enemies and strangers In gratitude, in danger Calling God's ten thousand names There is a prayer Like a wide river It never ends Does not begin Around the world It's always flowing And I am stepping in We are stepping in We are praying With those who've gone before us That great ancestral chorus We are joining as we sing We are praying With heroines and heroes Moses, Mary and Romero Yes, and Martin Luther King There is a prayer Like a wide river It never ends Does not begin Let us give thanks unto the Lord. O God of mercy, we praise you that in love you have reached across the abyss of our sin and brought us into your embrace. We thank you for the sacrifice of your Son on the cross, to seal us in the covenant of your new love. By your Spirit, give us the grace of repentance this day. And then guide us in the choices of righteousness that enable us to follow Jesus Christ on the way. Hear then our prayers as we pray for those we encounter in life, for your church around the world, we ask new life. For Christians in every land, we ask new unity in your name. For Jews and Muslims, and people of other faiths, we ask your divine blessing. For those who cannot believe, we ask your faithful love. For governors and rulers in every land, especially the Ukraine and Russia, we ask your guidance and strength. 
and for people who suffer and sorrow, especially those we know, and the people of the Ukraine, we ask your healing care. All these things we pray through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, you are safe with God. And you belong within God's everlasting care. Let go into God and trust God's ability to take care of you. And so now stand firm in your faith. Be courageous and strong, and let everything you do be done in love. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be yours now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.